yeah, I mean, I hope so. It's kind of, do you know what? I'm always, I, I always expect the worst. I'm before a gig, I'm always like, right, I'm going to expect that no one turns up and that like we forget how to play all the songs, and then I won't be disappointed if we remember how to play all the songs <laughs> and people turn up. Tom's a nightmare <laughs> now. I don't, I don't know why, but he's an absolute nightmare before a gig, and we always have to eat pasta, like the same thing every night. But it's it, on stage, yeah, completely different than you're in the stage. I just, I'm, I'm basically a bag of nerves all day. And then the minute I'm on stage and I realise it's all right, I'm like, oh yeah, it's a set, then I'm worried about it. I didn't use, I never used to be nervous. I don't think I used to be drunk, but like, I don't <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I've just kind of confidence. Yeah, exactly. But no, as the years have gone on, I just get more and more nervous. What do you prefer then? Venues like this, it's about 500 cap, but then you've done like Rico and you've played at Glastonbury and all all over the place. What do you prefer then now as a band? I love a tiny gig, like a really, really tiny. Like we played in Corby the other day as a as a little warm up in a place called the Zombie Hut. It's ridic ridiculous. People can literally just play your guitar if they want. Um, last night cool. they were quite close to you, though. They were pretty close. They were pretty, clo they were pretty close last night, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I, I I love that. I love being able to see the watch. But I, I love it when I can hear them singing back louder than I can hear me through my monitors. Do you know what I mean? That's that's amazing for me. But I also do love O2 Academy's. Uh, like they're the most comfortable size gig. I love the size of the stage, the size of the crowd. It's really like they're the ones I really enjoy doing. But also, I love the challenge then of going into a massive, you know, an arena or or a stadium or whatever, and going right now we've got to up our game and make this translate to people who are like all the way over there. Do you know what I mean? Right the way at the back, and and I mean we've done it. Did it with Oasis, and we've, we've done it with a bunch of bands, and it's doable. It's possible, and you actually get a massive buzz off it. <laughs> Of the new songs been going down then because the album's been out I think about a month now is it something like that has been still picking the fans up and jumping around yeah it's um it's really interesting now because you can see you can look out at the crowd and you can see the people who are really massive fans of the old stuff and you can see people who have only heard the new stuff And then you can see people who are just hardcore enemy fans that have, you know, that have bought every album, that just yeah. sing every word to every song. But it's really interesting seeing new fans that probably never liked the enemy before, but you know, listen to this album and went, "All oh, right, I'm into this." What have you been listening to when writing this record? Because. It is different with the other stuff. I think cause my favourite song on the album is um, The Waterfall. And I think it's got a little bit of U2 in there for me. Yeah, I get what you mean. I think vo a lot of the vocal production on that has got a bit of U2 in. We were definitely listening to more epic stuff and stuff that was produced better. So for guitar bands, there's a band called Dive. Fantagram, their, their stuff really, a lot, a lot of that. and. For vocal production, a lot of Bournes too. Like Bournes, just they absolutely smashing it with vocal production. The Horrors' latest album, there's some beautiful sounds on there in terms of drums and guitars. And you, have you changed your opinion on them now? Then, uh, um, do you know what? I, I've not. I mean, I've not seen them as people because I've, we've not bumped into each other for, yeah. for years and years and years. But that most recent album that they did was a really, really yeah, good album, and they completely reinvented themselves sound-wise. And you can, we, I actually went back and listened to the albums in between their first one and, and that one, and you can see the journey they've yeah. been on. But from my point of view, when I heard that album, that was just a complete change and a, a complete reinvention. I was like, well, do you know what? If they can make a change like that, any band can. And, and yeah, you know, it's kind of a bit of the inspiration to do what we did. Was there a reason that you made an album like this then? Because it would be quite easy to keep doing the same thing and just like screaming it for people to jump around, you know, for 45 minutes, lads in Fred Perry tops going mad. On this album, I feel like you've all laid your hearts quite firmly on the line, very honest, emotive record. Is that something that came easy or was that something that, you know, that's where you felt in your life that that's where the album had to go? It's, um, it's kind of just where we were and I, you're right. And the, the lads in Fred Perry tops jumping around is spot on. We could have done another one of those albums, <laughs> and 
And do you know what? We'd probably be playing bigger venues on this tour if we if we had. Saturday, Saturday. But I think we'd all got to a point where we didn't want to do just another one of those because then you become that band. And we're, you know, we're a bit geeky about music and about making music and we enjoy it. And it was kind of like, you know, let's push ourselves to push the envelope with production a bit, to be more honest with the subject matters for the songs. All I had was you. And let's just keep pushing ourselves and, you know, I think you've got to do that with every album or it just goes stale, so it's just the point we were at, to be honest. Tell me something, some tell me a lot about the lyrics then on the record. Are they all personal to yourself? What kind of journeys or events happened while writing the record that influenced it? Basically, for the last, like, what, eight years or so, I think I've just had about a million relationships and they've all gone wrong. So Player. Yeah, <laughs> plenty, of, <laughs> plenty, of, plenty of subject matter. But, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of them are just, you know, messy breakups, difficult relationships, meeting new people and being excited and, you know, all of that, which previously was probably too personal for enemy songs when you, you know, you're writing the old albums. It wouldn't have fitted. Um, a lot of these are actually quite old songs and... That, that weren't, you know, that were written years ago, but didn't go on the new albums because they were too personal, and I wasn't really comfortable, and they didn't suit the record. But then, it, it just, yeah, it just works for this record. It was just, you know, it's kind of like, well, we've been brave with the music. Let's be brave with the with the subject matter and the lyrics and, and everything too. It really does. And listening back to the record, I'm playing it on a night time. Do you sometimes, you know? Come, end up going back into that feeling when you re wrote the song? Oh, do you know what? Every time I hear a recording of an enemy song, whether it's this album or any of the previous ones, it takes me back to the day we recorded it. And like, I remember the studio, I remember the smell, I remember like how hungry I was. It's really weird. Like when I, <laughs> like, when I, when I listen to like, Had Enough. It takes me right back to that studio in Brixton. Yeah. I remember the temperature of the house. I remember the smell of that cooker, of you yeah, making spaghetti yeah, bolognese. That's and why we don't play the second well, album. <laughs> <laughs> it just reminds of me and Tom arguing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's kind of it's really weird when I listen back. But do you know what? This album that we just made, I know it's probably because it's newer, but this is the album that I've listened to the most since we finished recording it. Because I still, like, normally you record an album and you, you're just like, right, I can't listen to that because it feels weird. I don't know. I don't know if all bands get that, but I definitely do. This album, I just keep putting it on. I'm like, you know what? I love it because there's little bits in there, there's bits of production and stuff that I look forward to hearing. And I'm like, I'm sort of into my own album. <laughs> That's all right though, because I spoke to John Bramwell from I Am Clue a few months ago, and he said when you wrote the latest record, I Am Clue, he said he drove around where he lives in his car, and at the end he just sat crying and went, Yeah, I'm all right, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not bad. So putting this record out, were you nervous at all, knowing that it was a different direction? Were you afraid that you'd lose some of those? enemy fans who've been there from the start who may not get it or think that's what you're about. Yeah, I mean, it was a massive risk. Um, we could have we could have lost everything. I mean, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, you know, I can imagine people going, oh, the enemy, I liked them until they did that and now I don't like them. And, you know, that, that affects your ticket sales and that's our bread and butter is touring the country. And, you know, that that is, that's what we do. And if you lose that, well, if we lose that, that's that's kind of it for the band. And so it was a massive risk, but, I think you just got to, it's all about timing and it was just the right time to take that risk and it paid off because I think we've probably gained a lot of new fans that listened to the old enemy stuff and went, nah, I'm not into that and they probably had an image in their head of us in 2006 and, you know, probably like head to toe clad in Adidas and, you know, spouting whatever, you know, and, and, and also, you know, what, what I've said is, you know, it's very difficult to judge people on their persona as well because I mean a recorded interview is one thing because you can I mean I guess someone could misunderstand what I'm saying here but ultimately this is what I'm saying when you do interviews where people interview you and then they they put their take on it and their slant on it it's kind of the editorial effectively people create your public persona for you and it's that's a really quite a difficult thing to keep control of but I, I think a lot of people that had pre like previously written the enemy off and gone, that's not a band that I'm into. I've listened to this record and hopefully heard some of the interviews and gone, do you know what, I kind of like that record and I'm going to give the band a chance and go to a gig. And for us that's massive and it's amazing to see people that weren't enemy fans at our shows.
depends what day you catch me on. Um, some days I'll just be like, I'll oh, let them write what they want. They're, you know, they're not they're not even doing it. They're just writing about what I'm doing. So, do you know what I mean? If, on some days I'm like that, and on other, on other days I can read the slightest bit of criticism and go, right, well, there's no point being in a band anymore then, because that's that's what people think. Everyone in a band, to some extent, has a thick skin that they put on when they're dealing with the media, and if you if you if you've suited up and you've got your thick skin on, you can read just about anything and laugh it off and go, whatever, I don't care. You know, like, these people mean nothing to me. They're doing a job, I'm doing a job, and I don't even need to read it. And I don't read a lot of our press, if I'm honest now. But it's when you're ambushed with press. It's when you, I mean, when I was on Twitter, it's when you're scrolling through Twitter and you see a link to something and you just, you know you shouldn't, but you click it and you know it's going to say something horrible. Um, you click it and you read it and you're just at home in your tracky bees just watching a bit of come dine with me and you're not prepared for it you haven't got your thick skin on and it just gets you and on those days it can really really ruin you and i know from speaking to other people in other bands that's that's not just me that i think that's how we all feel but... I don't know if the media know that or if they think, oh, no one ever reads what we do anyway, but we do. All people in bands read what read what you write, and sometimes it hurts. It's like going scrolling through your new girlfriend's Facebook photos and getting to the ones before you knew her, and you're looking back and saying, who's that with your arm around her? Yeah. It's that sinking, gut-wrenching feeling, isn't it? Yeah, no, he's, he's massive, look at him. <laughs> he's, he's seven foot. <laughs> he's seven <laughs> foot. <laughs> Let's stick with the social media thing. Tom, you made a conscious decision to come off Twitter for all the stuff that was getting said about you. Inappropriate, uncalled for, personal stuff, nothing to do with the band. You then came out and talked about your struggles and battles, which I think is quite honourable, you know, because a lot of people connect with your music and your band. We think working class lads, you know, we all walk around and stuff, but not a lot of people come out and speak about it. And I think you doing that would have encouraged a lot of men, especially, to come and speak about a stigma, was that something that was difficult for you to do? Right, I, I tell you the reason that, it, that I'd not done that before is I actually think a lot of people do come out. I think a lot of, in inverted commas, which you can't see on radio, celebrities or people in the public eye, I think they do. I think they all, I think they basically go in the back door at Waterstones, write down all their troubles and difficulties that they've had in life and then try and make lots of money out of it and I'm not into that. Um, maybe I'm really cynical there. I kind of, the only reason that I even mentioned it was to add context to the reasons that I was leaving Twitter because I thought it was quite pertinent and I wanted to explain to the fans, nobody else, because there are lots of fans on, on our Twitter who I regularly engage with and I always speak to people and until it got to ridiculous numbers I used to reply to every single tweet and I wanted to explain to them why I wasn't going to do that anymore because I didn't want them to feel like I'd just abandoned them. That is the only reason I really did that and actually the, the press were really quite understanding and I didn't expect to be, I expected to get rinsed even more the minute I put that out but I didn't care because I felt like I had a responsibility to our fans and, and they come first essentially because they, without them we don't get to do this. Fans were very understanding and I think it actually has probably helped with sort of friends and everyone that, that we work with to maybe understand things about the band a little bit more and you know but I do think I, I, in general I used to love Twitter and do you know what I'd say 80% of Twitter is people, because Twitter's different as well, if, you, if you're not in a band, if you're just a person on Twitter, Twitter's great, you very rarely get abuse unless you say something stupid. If you're in a band or if you've got a little blue tick or whatever next to you know, you're a target and people will literally, just drunk people in a bowl go, oh let's rinse him on there and, and that's great for them because they're having a great night but we are real people too and just because you're verified, just because you're in the public eye doesn't mean you're not a person and you don't have feelings. And, I used to, when I was younger, I used to go, oh, well, they put themselves out there, they know what, they know what they're doing, they know the risks. Like, if you make money out of being in the public, then you take the flack that goes with it. But there's a line, I think, and when you start attacking people for how they look, things that they can't change, attack me for what I do all day long. If you think that our songs are rubbish, tell me our songs are rubbish and I'll ask you to show me where your songs are. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it kind of, but, but ultimately, it's kind of, you know, when you, when you start attacking stuff that I didn't make, that's where I draw the line and go, well, I can either argue with you on that, and I used to do that, I used to get dragged into it, and I used to engage, and I'll be honest with you, I probably wouldn't test me on that either, because I've got a right mouth on me, and I'll probably just undress you in front of all your, like, all your mates on Twitter and make you look a right tall. But <laughs> occasionally, you know, occasionally I do that. I, I just got to the point, I think you get to an age in life where you go, I don't need that, I don't need, like, I've got so many hours in my day, 
and I don't need one of them to be full of negativity and, and stuff that's just not good. There's life's really short and there's better things you can be doing than arguing with idiots on Twitter. And I just went, you know what? When the idiots on Twitter aren't just lads who are drunk in a bar, and it's actually allegedly, you know, so-called professional journalists who are engaging in that as well. At that point, you go, well, this is just stupid, and I'm off. And you just walk out because at that point that's the bigger thing to do, and you have to just be the bigger man at that point and go, I'm not, I'm not engaging in this childish behaviour. You felt happier since as well, haven't you? Just oh, not, honestly, not carrying that round in your pocket. Yeah, yeah, I've had, time, I've had loads more time, and and uh, you know, I mean, you genuinely have more time in your day, it, unless Twitter is something that you love, that is a positive force in your life, and social media in general, unless it's something that you get something out of. I just think, honestly, just get rid of it because there is so much social pressure to be on social media and for it to be a part of your life but look at what you get out of it as you would with everything else in your life it's time that you're giving away and it's your time and you've got a finite amount of it unless you're getting something great out of it suck it off what you said there about professional journalists and stuff you wouldn't go in the office and start calling people like that every day would you because you get the sack i think it's a disgrace i saw the article in question and it was bang out of order yeah, I mean, I, and I've got to say, I think there's a slightly wider issue that it's not my place to bang on about. I don't know whose place it is, um, but I know that it's a responsibility that I'm, I, I can't assume because I've got plenty on my plate. But the, this industry is completely unregulated in terms of bullying, not just from celebrities in bands getting bullying, in terms of there is no legislation. So all our crew that are working for us today that are setting up our guitars, our amps, our microphones, there is no protection for them in terms of bullying from each other, from us, from anyone in the industry. Where the music industry is one of the last industries to legislate against it. And that's one of our crew just opening a really loud door, ruining the interview for us now. <laughs> Don't start bullying him, will you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't. I'll let him get away with it because I've got him. There's no legislation. <laughs> the first thing that I do is go and eat. Um, some really bland, safe pasta, or something that I know isn't going to mess me up. Um, and then uh, usually, usually pace around the dressing room anxiously for about two hours, uh, questioning all the things that could possibly go wrong. Then scheduling about half an hour of just complete self-doubt of <laughs> asking why I'm even in a band in the first place, <laughs> and considering phoning my old manager and asking if I can go and sell TVs again. And then. Roughly two minutes of no, no, this will be okay. This will be okay. Let's just go out and do it, and then we go out and do it. <laughs> Last night on stage, I walked on and, and genuinely, before the end of the first song, I was just like, "This is amazing!" Like just seeing the looks on people's faces because we haven't toured for a while, and seeing people see us and you can tell they're enjoying it. It's like. If they're enjoying it, I'm enjoying it, because that's why we do it. We do it we do it for them and we do it for us. So as long as they're happy and we're happy, everyone's happy. Final two questions. What do you think about the music industry at the moment then? Because I know you personally have helped out some unsigned musicians. Alistair Shearing for one, I know Alistair. April who's been supporting you from your neck of the woods as well, I believe out there have been supporting you somewhere around there. What why did you feel that you need to give people a leg up then, such bands like that, where when you were busy doing your own stuff as well? I think it's really, really difficult. Um, it's always been difficult. It was difficult when we were doing it, but I think it's becoming more and more difficult to break a band because there are fewer and fewer outlets and I'm hoping with the way that radio is changing over the next few years. There's some pretty big changes going to happen in radio, which means that guitar music should be a little bit back on everyone's radar. But ultimately, I'd love to sit here and complain about it and go, oh, there's not enough guitars on radio. Music's cyclical and it comes round in, in cycles and stuff goes out of fashion and comes back in fashion and it's the way it works and, you know, you kind of... And also, there are, like, class tunes out there. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. Being I, played, do you did know you mean? know what? There's a lot of music that's really brilliant. And I, so I run a nightclub in Coventry as well now. And a lot of the music that I love and that I listen to are just massive club tunes. Do you know what I mean? And it's yeah. kind of like, you kind of... And it also gives us, like, influence to the new album. All, like, pop music. I, I love pop music. I think, production-wise, 
the thing if you I like, love all the sub bass and things like that and that's yeah. what we wanted in our new songs yeah, yeah, yeah. you've got to be open minded enough I think to enjoy all types of music so I'm, nev I'm never going to be the guy that sits here and goes you know, oh, there should be more guitar music. Do you know what? I, I think music pretty much meets the demand that there is for different genres good of music, music at the moment. Good yeah, music. good music of all genres will will shine through, and and that includes guitars. I I, but I do think that it's really important to help out musicians. And when we did, when we helped out the unsigned bands, we weren't going. Oh, we're only going to help out guitar music. I, you know, we, we were just. Any type of music, I don't care what it is, we'll help you out. And you know, there was some folk bands we worked with, and, and all sorts of stuff. I think it's just a, it's a really good thing to do. Apart from anything else, it reminds you how lucky you are to be in the position that you're in. Because I think a lot of bands can quite easily feel a bit hard done by and go, you know, oh, I wish we were bigger. I wish we. Were. Do you know what? It, we're really, really lucky to be doing what we're doing and working with some unsigned bands that are right at the beginning of their career, trying to get that first break sort of puts that into focus for you. I am a prisoner in this prison of words. I have no freedom. Well, I think this new album of yours is incredible. It's different, but it's definitely up there still for me. Like I said, to Waterfall, I tweeted you, Andy, didn't I? And I said, they pulled me to pieces, actually. I was up at half past five one morning, listened to the album full stop, and I was like, actually, I don't mind that I've been up at half five. I may feel a bit more teary now, but it was absolute quality. I've got one last question to ask you, which everyone who comes on the programme. If you had to get one of your own lyrics tattooed on your arm, which one would it be? Oh, God. Uh, probably O, O, O. Because <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just looked like a weird sort of numbers thing. I don't know. Um, I'd probably I'd get one from, yeah, I mean, we see fans with lyrics of ours all the time, which I find mental. And I'm just like, I just, I just want to give them a hug and be like, you're properly into our band, fair play. I'd go, I'd go for well, the lyrics from... Well, that is real, so it's like, ah. Uh, is that a real tattoo? I'd go for the one from. <laughs> I'd, literally I'd go for the one from Melody, which is I don't need a magazine to tell me how I feel because sometimes I need reminding of that. So it'd be a decent one to have. But seriously, if I was going to get any tattoo, not one of our lyrics, because uh, I haven't got any tattoos. Like I got to this age, not had any tattoos. Um, I, I've seriously considered recently having my organ donor register number just on my chest so that when I inevitably am found upside down in, in a car in a ditch somewhere having done something stupid, which is a, that is an inevitability. That problem. Yeah, like, when that happens, at least I won't mess around giving someone else who deserves a more of my lungs and my kidneys. That is true, he's been saying that for a while. <laughs> yeah. I hope that's not an exclusive. Lads, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> Cheers for chatting to us on the radio today.